in this lecture we will be dealing with a very important uh, uh, chapter in uh, Susurta's great classic dealing with fractures uh, which must have been uh, very common in his time uh, considering the great length at which he discusses this subject and from among the large number of surgical procedures which uh, Susurta describes I have taken an assortment for uh, discussion. Now the contents of uh, this lecture are the classification of fractures into 12 different types. He differentiated fractures from dislocations. Uh, there are a number of illustrated examples. Uh, then the treatment of uh, fractures, how to deal with them, then the surgical procedures, a listing of them and a number of examples, the common like wounds, piles, plastic reconstruction of the nose, number of these uh, uh, topics uh, which are common or which are of interest from other angles, all those I have taken uh, for brief mention or for detailed discussion. And I will conclude this by dealing with a very important subject uh, that is the decline of surgery in Ayurveda. Uh, that is a matter of uh, great interest uh, which we should look at uh, with some special attention. Now fractures, uh, the Sushruta's time India was largely a forested country and most of the transport was like bullock carts and so on. So the commonest uh, cause for fractures uh, falling off the trees or trees falling on people, attacks by wild animals uh, or wars. Uh, these were not infrequent, uh, small uh, kingdoms attacking armies, fighting. So number of examples you will find of uh, injuries including fractures. Uh, these were all the common causes uh, in those days and there is a detailed classification of fractures uh, which uh, uh, stands out in the Susruta Samhita and the treatment of uh, fractures and dislocations. We will be dealing much less with dislocations mostly I will be concentrating on fractures which are much more common. Now here the first is uh, called Karkataka. Here there is a long bone, there will be illustrations to follow. There is a fracture in the middle of the long shaft of a bone with the edges bent but not too much of a deformity. That is the first type. Second is called Ashwakarna where there is a fracture in the mid shaft but there is gross angular deformity. That is another kind. Then there is comminuted fracture or Churnita where the bone is fragmented into several bits. Then Pichita there, there is a compression like a hammer blow a crush fracture that is another kind. Then there is the uh, fifth kind called Asthichalita. The two fractured ends are displaced downwards and sideways. That depends on the kind of force which produce that fracture and also pull of muscles which are attached to these two bone ends. Then there is Khandapagna where the two fractured ends are almost free floating because there are not too many muscles attached to those two fractured ends. Then we have Majanugata, there is a fracture but one end of the fracture is pushed into or uh, impacted into the bone marrow of the other fragment, impacted fracture. Then there is Atipatita, one fractured end is held up because there is a muscle attached, another one droops because there is no muscle attached to that. Then there is Vakra or green stick fracture in children where the bone is not very rigid, it is flexible, it is a kind of a curvature produced by Vakra. And the next two Chinna and uh, Patita, these are unusual, they are not complete fractures, only one surface of the bone is uh, damaged. It may be by shrapnels uh, impacting there or most likely there were no shrapnels in those days possibly. So it could be an animal attacking and one side of the bone is damaged uh, by an animal bite maybe, but the other half is intact. So it is not a complete fracture not very common but those are those two are described by Sushruta and lastly there is a hairline crack in the bone it is not a complete fracture but it has to be treated like a fracture. These are the different varieties now you see the pictures here you can see the first uh, figure on the left hand side that is a, a femur the thigh bone which is a long bone and that there is a fracture in the middle the angulation is not very much but there can be very big swelling of the thigh because there is a lot of bleeding 
because of this long bone fracture that is one one type and the second the next figure that you see uh, that is a mid shaft uh, fracture in the middle of the leg below the knee and there it is a complete fracture of both bones and you can see the angular deformity is much more severe and then we have the next uh, picture you see complete uh, fragmentation of bone what is called comminuted fracture a very severe type of injury that is again shown in the femur as an example and the last figure you see is a typical uh, pichita that is a hammer blow accidentally and that crushes the uh, bone and soft tissues then we come to this uh, adhipatita that is a, a jaw fracture and you can see the typical deformity because the rear part of the jaw is held up by a very powerful muscle called masseter and that masseter is plays a very important role in chewing that pulls up the upper fragment since there is no such a strong muscular attachment in the lower fragment it droops so it has a typical uh, deformity of uh, the jaw and then we come to asthichalita there is again a femur is shown as an example there is a mid shaft fracture but the displacement is very uh, severe so you can see the two ends are uh, side by side that cross section shown there so one side is uh, lo lower the other side is uh, sideways displacement so that displacement is typically caused by the kind of uh, injury the way he fell down or a hammer blow that really decides how these two ends are displaced here they are side by side and all these are important because there were no x rays in those days the deformity the characteristics of the deformity sometimes difficult to make out because of the enormous swelling so a good deal of uh, clinical acumen was necessary uh, to understand what kind of displacement might have taken place before you start the reduction and the last picture lower down what you see the the wrist number of small bones there are seven or eight bones there and one of them scaphoid there is a hairline fracture there even with x rays nowadays it is not easy to make out this hairline fracture it can even be missed you may consider it as a sprain and send the patient away but unlike a sprain even after a week or two weeks the pain doesn't go the swelling continues now that is a, could be a scaphoid fracture now these hairline fractures were recognized not necessarily scaphoid but there was a, a type of fracture which was incomplete that was also recognized called sputita in uh, those days now the treatment there was a great deal of emphasis on the general treatment the patient's uh, nutrition he should be given adequate rest if there is an open wound suppose it is a compound fracture the skin the muscles they are all damaged they are open there is a laceration and there is a fracture underneath in that case the attention the toilet of the wound is extremely important foreign bodies must be removed it should be cleaned that has to be very thoroughly done all those must be done and uh, medical pace are applied and don't then only the bandage etc will come but the management of the fracture itself there were four procedures which are surprisingly similar to what we do today the very first is traction the two ends are and again the patient is given only wine and he is held because it is quite painful uh, there was no anesthetic at that time so the method, the method followed was to give plenty of wine to the patient and physical restraint and the traction of that limb which is the bone which is fractured that usually brings the two and smaller or less into alignment but it doesn't stop there there is always some manipulation and compression following the traction so the both ends are coming together then a certain amount of manipulation is necessary here familiarity with anatomy imagining how the normal alignment should be those are very important experience so that's how you bring these two displaced ends more or less into alignment that is the uh, process of uh, manipulation and compression then we have immobilization we then there is immobilization in that position that is where a splint becomes very useful and the splint may be a bark splint or a bamboo uh, these are all used to immobilize in that particular position where the alignment is right and then bandaging is done that is the these are the four stages traction manipulation and compression immobilization and bandaging these four steps are uh, more or less what we do today for uh, reduction of fractures and the you can you have see there is a figure at the bottom uh, that is using a bark splint these were barks of uh, uh, trees specially chosen specially prepared cut 
to size and so on, uh, these are used to immobilize uh, the limb. Now, suppose there is a fracture of the uh, long bones like the pictures you have seen, sometimes it is necessary to immobilize it and if it is a fracture of the thigh, you cannot expect the patient to walk, there was no way it could be done, no nothing like a crutches are described. So often it is necessary to have rest for the patient on a rigid bed, what is called kapata shayana in those days and this is a special fracture bed and the principle of treatment in uh, treating a long bone fracture, you should immobilize the joint above and below, then only you can immobilize that bone, mo preventing movements. Now here is an example, if there is a fracture of the middle of the leg, you will find the ankle and the knee are immobilized by having those pegs and there is a peg, a solitary peg at the foot, so that the foot is kept in the right, right angles. So that those pegs will make sure the foot is kept at right angle and the leg does not move, the two tibia and fibula. When it comes to the thigh bone, if you have to immobilize on this rigid bed, then you have the hip and the knee, they are immobilized. So that principle was recognized, the joints above and below must be immobilized. Then we have surgical procedures, I have listed a number of them, I will not be discussing all of them, but some of them I will be discussing. Wounds, and extensive descriptions are there because these were probably the commonest condition the surgeons had to treat, wounds by a variety of uh, causes. Then piercing the ear, a great deal of discussion is held on piercing the ear for several reasons. One, it was the commonest procedure for puncturing, uh, almost as a ritual it was done for children, but some of these would get infected. That is how it became a major cause for the surgeon's worry because if the ear piercing is followed by infection, infection was called a dosha disorder at that time. If that happened, sometimes it would be that the ear lobe itself might uh, uh, become necrotic, it might drop off or it might become a very large ulcer, all these kind of problems and uh, finally end up with a very ugly looking scar which is very prominent. So those uh, uh, disfigurement or deficiency in the ear lobe itself, all these could be treated with the plastic uh, surgery. And uh, Susruta has some very interesting uh, surgical procedures, how a flap could be taken from the cheek and uh, this repair could be done. So this uh, ear repair and ear piercing, uh, these were subjects of great interest, but I will not be uh, dealing with that in that much detail today, uh, but that is an important uh, surgical uh, condition. And then plastic reconstruction of uh, ear, nose and lips, I will be discussing nose because that is the best known operation originating in India. So I will not be discussing the reconstruction of the ear or the lips, I will be concentrating on the nose reconstruction which we will do shortly. And then we have piles, I will be discussing that, anal fistula, again very commonly done procedure but I will not be spending much time on those. Removal of urinary bladder stone, uh, one of the most uh, uh, severe procedures uh, described in uh, Susruta Samhita, but I will not be spending time on that. Insertion and drainage of abscesses, another extensively discussed subject, probably very common at that time. Intestinal obstruction and perforation, very dangerous operations, often attended by poor results. I will not be discussing that. Inguinal hernia, excision of glandular swellings in different parts of the body, drainage of ascites or dropsy, chronic ulcers, hydrocele, couching for cataract, I will make a reference to that and malpositions of fetus. These are some of the conditions which received a lot of attention in uh, Susruta Samhita, uh, but obviously we will not have the time uh, to discuss all these, I will be selective in uh, dealing with these. Now general observations, now one is uh, always these procedures, there will be very detailed description on indications, when should you do it. Uh, secondly, when you should not do it, that both these are uh, very important for a surgeon, especially when you are beginning, uh, there are uh, certain uh, conditions where it is better that you do not intervene, because intervention will be attended by poor results or even danger to life. Uh, so those are always uh, listed separately and uh, the, the 
contraindication for example may not be a local one suppose the man has got tuberculosis or is wasted some other severe disease jaundice whatever so that may decide against uh, uh, going in for a surgical operation then the second thing which attracted great deal of attention was citing the incisions this again we have covered earlier because it was important to have the right uh, length of the incision if it is too short remember the patient is not under anesthetic so you don't have too much of a leeway you have to be exact even plan it earlier so that exact length of the operation and sometimes you may have to have more than one incision an abscess a very large abscess with one incision you may not be able to drain it completely you may have to have a second incision made all that you should plan ahead uh, so that you cannot do any planning during the procedure when you are under a great deal of uh, pressure and similarly sometimes operations may have to be staged it cannot be done in one go for example especially fistula anal fistula a complicated one you may not be able to do complete in one procedure but there again you should know in the first stage what is the operation i am going to do what is the incision i am going to make in the second phase what is the incision i am going to make all these should be planned properly staged procedures yeah, these are again uh, described then the post operative care how to general care of the patient uh, general health is nutrition especially repeatedly stressed and local attention how to keep it clean how to apply the dressings and so on and uh, lastly the point which has been made earlier if you are dealing with a very dangerous condition for example intestinal perforation or an imp or uh, obstructed labor uh, things of that kind operations of that kind which carry a very great risk patient may die under those conditions you have to have prior permission taken from the king's officers all these must be done these are the general considerations then we come to the wounds which are very uh, uh, elaborately described in the susrata samhita we go from the most severe to the mild that is the way he has covered it one is severed uh, limbs that is a deep cut and it may result for example a deep cut in this area by a sword a cut has been made and it may be partly separated at the ear or a limb for example or it may be completely severed that is a deep cut these are the severed that is one kind of injury and the next is ruptured here there is a penetrating injury to the chest or to the abdomen with a, a spear or a sword or any kind of sharp instrument an attack if that happens often this kind of penetrating injury it damages the viscera it may be the lung which is damaged it may be the heart it may be the intestine or stomach or the liver all this could be damaged by this ruptured bhinna that injury now that is a, a second kind and the features are also given body cavity is pierced and there is spillage of blood if the urinary bladder has been stuck then there will be urine spillage into the abdomen so these are very dangerous uh, conditions carrying very high risk and the punctured sharp object enters for example the buttocks or it may be the back it doesn't enter any body cavity but it does go deep into the tissue sometimes a part of it may be broken off it may be retained inside now that is the punctured that in type then we have laceration a deep irregular type of laceration suppose somebody fell so he falls over a, a sharp object and there is a sharp laceration uh, doesn't go into body cavity uh, but it is a deep laceration deep cut and the next is the crush injury uh, uh, a tree falling on somebody for example it may be combined with uh, damage to the bone or joints a lot of soft tissues are compressed but there is no open laceration there that is the crush injury and lastly abrasions which are small uh, superficial uh, skin abrasions those are the mildest so you can see from the severed that is the most severe type of injury and the most mild that is the abrasion so these are the uh, uh, different varieties of wounds which a surgeon comes across out of these the last two the crush and the abraded there is no open wound they don't bleed so much whereas all the others laceration or rupture etc they are attended by a great deal of bleeding uh, so that these crush injuries uh, it was noted in those days one of the great problems they faced was uh, suppuration or what we would call inflammation that was the problem there not bleeding 
Now the principles of management we cannot discuss the details of doing that but severed wound suppose there is a deep cut involving a certain amount of rupture partial or complete there they had the method followed was let us say the ear lobe which was a common uh, place where these severed injuries could occur uh, that was replaced and sutured after cleaning and a deep cut with uh, severance of limbs is treated in the same manner uh, if there is a fracture that is reduced uh, then the suturing is done and demobilization is done so that was uh, the practice but suppose the severance is complete and the reattachment is not possible uh, then there is you have to remove that and treat it like an amputation and the stump is uh, treated with cautery and an appropriate dressing is given this was the the principles are the same even today every attempt will be made today of course the reattachment has become very scientific uh, what is being done today could not be done even say 30 years ago. We have such fine uh, techniques today to, re to reattach blood vessels for example or nerves. All these could not be done 30 years ago. Certainly in Susurda's time that kind of precision was not possible but the principle was the same. Every attempt was made to reattach the severed uh, limb or severed uh, ear whichever part of the body wherever possible that reattachment was attempted. And if it was not possible, then of course you should uh, cut it off and uh, repair that wound. Then the rupture, this eye, I think it is a mistake to put it in the, it is also part of the severed and it is difficult to imagine orbit is not a body cavity. Under what circumstances the eye would be dislocated? Uh, what kind of injury? We do not see that often now, but avulsion of the eye, this is repeatedly mentioned. There must have been some cause for that. Now if that happens again, uh, that should be replaced as long as the vision was there, the eye was intact, vision was there but the eyeball is sticking out, falling off. Under what circumstances this injury occurred is uh, mystifying, I cannot really follow uh, but the attempt is made to replace that and then it is cleaned with ghee and is covered with a, a lotus leaf, that was the wound dressing. And the rupture in the abdomen, it is discussed but also the very great risk is pointed out because often it was attended, you have to open the abdomen, you have to repair the uh, injury to the intestine or the stomach or urinary bladder and then you have to close the abdomen and these were attended with very high risk. One little observation which is of interest, when you deal with intestinal perforations, uh, these high risk uh, operations, Susrita describes a very interesting way of repairing that uh, hole in the intestine. And uh, even though we have seen uh, in the description on uh, in the instruments, the needles were known, a suture material was known. In spite of all that, when you discuss with the, the closure of the a hole in the intestine, uh, there is a very interesting technique he describes. There is a certain type of ants, black ants and these have horns and they are attached to the intestinal perforation, the two edges. And once they bite very strongly, uh, the two edges are brought together, then the hind part of the ant is cut off. A series of ants are used to bring these edges together and the rear part, only the head with the, uh, their horns, uh, they are there to hold it together. Uh, this was a method used by Sushruta in repairing these intestinal perforations. It is not very clear why a needle and thread was not used, but I thought that is an interesting point in uh, repairing these intestinal perforations. And we have punctured a foreign body is sticking in and the method followed was to remove that uh, foreign body carefully. There is a, a channel and that channel was cleaned and then a probe, a medicated probe, a probe, a cotton wick for example, soaked in a medicated ointment or whatever other medications the physician decides, it is soaked in that and that is used to plug this uh, channel. And slowly every day it will be taken out and if it is healing from the bottom, a shorter wick will be introduced. So over a period of days or weeks, uh, that channel would be healed completely. That was the method followed for the punctured wounds. And lacerations, cleaning, apposition of uh, edges and then the suturing is done to repair. That was the standard way apart from the attention to general, the rest of, rest of the patient, nutrition, diet, etc. All these are repeatedly mentioned in the management of these wounds. Uh, this was one of the commonest conditions which the surgeons had to deal with. 
then we come to piles again a very common condition there are six types uh, described the anatomy is uh, fairly well described in the piles I won't get into all that but here we are only dealing with the surgical procedures there were three ways of uh, uh, treatment of piles one is the use of caustics the other is the use of cauterization and the third is uh, surgery excision these were the three methods now the caustics were used we have already discussed how the caustics are prepared uh, by the surgeon by the three different types uh, a strong type a medium type and a mild type three types of uh, caustics are prepared they are available they are in the form of a creamy type of a substance uh, now this is used in uh, treating the piles which one to be chosen that is the decision of the surgeon and initially the patient is given lubricant therapy or snehana followed by swedana that is the fermentation body fermentation these are given uh, administered in all these procedures that is first uh, given and then the the instruments which you saw uh, one is the arsho yantra or proctoscope that is introduced now in the use of this piles you will the description you will find the surgeon has to do a certain amount of manipulation some procedure so that larger uh, arsho yantra which we showed in the instruments that is what is used with larger slit so that is introduced after lubrication and the pile masses are visualized very clearly and there in the first caustic alkali is used only if the pile masses are soft that is the description they are large they are soft and they are deep and raised so the instrument has to go a little deeper compared to the other one which is used for treating fistula which need not be so deep so this particular arsho yantra is introduced and you can see the soft pile masses which are large may have, may we have a fairly large base and that is the kind of mass which is suitable for applying the caustics and the caustic is taken with a rod instrument a shalaka type of instrument and that is smeared on this pile mass which is in full view and after applying this uh, this is closed is turned and for a certain number of 30 matras one matra is uh, the time you take to pronounce a short syllable that much time you wait and then you turn it and see that pile mass again that is just been exposed to this caustic for that much time and then if it is properly done uh, you can see that maybe the shape the slightly shrunken and also the uh, like a jambu fruit it has certain amount of thrombosis is taking place so it is discolored and it has become a little shrunken so you know that this is adequate if you are satisfied with the result of that application of caustic you can leave it alone but if you are not satisfied you can apply that again and once again repeat this procedure so that is the caustic uh, application uh, the uh, first uh, uh, treatment of this type of uh, piles but suppose the pile mass is different and uh, it is uh, hard uh, maybe a narrow base or a big base and high up that kind of uh, pile mass then this caustic may not be satisfactory so there 100 seconds i i made it mistake 100 seconds uh, is the time you give for the application of the caustic and uh, if you apply the pile mass looks not soft it looks hard it looks immobile and it is all fairly high up if that kind caustic may not be satisfactory there you may have to apply cauterization or you may have to do excision so if this mass which is hard unlike the soft one earlier and it is a fairly high up and it has a narrow base then it is an ideal case for excision uh, that is what is followed or if it is uh, base is not so narrow narrow pedicle then you may have to apply cauterization so it depends on the characteristics of that pile mass whether you are applying a caustic or whether you are doing cauterization these are the two procedures but ideally the effort always is to apply caustics if you can treat with that that is the best but if it is a hard rough mass uh, then it is not very suitable for caustics you may have to do cauterization or excision so that is the gradation in which you consider these procedures at the same time the general care diet oral intake herbal formulations all these are done in regardless of which particular technique that you are following 
Now then we come to this uh, uh, operation of plastic reconstruction of the nose, uh, which is perhaps the most uh, famous operation uh, described by Sushruta. It is in fact labeled as Indian method of rhinoplasty. That is perhaps the only operation which uh, designed in India, which has got international recognition. Now Sushruta's description, however, is fairly brief. Uh, considering the great uh, fame of this operation, uh, the whole thing is described in a matter of two or three verses. That is all. Uh, that it is something which uh, it, it, there is a message in that. We will talk about it a little later. It is, there is an interesting history about this operation. So I am going to spend a little time on this. Uh, there was a surgeon, uh, physician, surgeon in those days, Dr. Scott. He was an employee of the East India Company who was based in uh, Bombay in the 18th uh, century. Now he took a lot of interest in the uh, uh, India's uh, uh, various types of illnesses of the natives, uh, the procedures that the native physicians did. He took a lot of interest unlike many others who never cared for what the natives were doing. And one day the captain Irvine uh, who was also stationed in Bombay, he told him about this uh, uh, practice uh, that is not uncommon among the Gentus. Gentus are Hindus, that was the way he pronounced, of putting new noses on people who had had them cut out. This is what this captain told Dr. Scott. And ca this captain Irvine, he had been assured by the company surgeon Mr. Findlay. Mr. Findlay, you know, in Britain, surgeons are called Mr. Uh, if you pass your MBBS, you are a doctor. But after you train as a surgeon and become a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, you are called Mr. Uh, this is the uh, only in, uh, in Britain you will see this. There is a history behind it because uh, surgeons were barbers in the 16th century, 15th century. Barbers were the surgeons, barber surgeons. Uh, so that uh, tradition, they are called Mr. They are not called doctor. Only physicians were called doctors. So many years later, Surgery developed as developed as medicine. They are also doctors. But in Britain, this tradition, they are very traditional people. They take pride in the fact, I am Mr. So and so. So a doctor becomes a Mr. So that is how even now, every year, uh, there is a, a dinner, a most worshipful company of barbers and the Royal College of Surgeons of England. They have a dinner every year to celebrate this common ancestry. So here, Mr. Findlay was the surgeon. He was stationed in Pune. And he had told his captain Irvine, such a procedure is not known in Europe that is putting a nose. This is what, but Scott took interest in this. Though Scott wrote to this Findlay in Pune asking about this procedure. And this is a quotation. It is a long quotation, but I think it is worth reading of great historical importance. You can read it, but I will read it with you. On the second instant, I was favored with your last letter wherein you express a strong desire of having some facts collected respecting the custom in this country of putting noses on those who have lost them. It affords me pleasure to inform you that we have ascertained in the most satisfactory manner that individuals or rather families of a certain caste of people in Hindustan have from time immemorial been acquainted with and practice the art of putting on noses. And I have had at this moment before me two Maratha prisoners of the Seringapatam. Seringapatam is Tipus, where the British and uh, Mysore army had clashed. May or June 1792 without noses. They had been cut off by Tipu soldiers. These two men have now their face decorated with noses of a natural size and tolerable shape which are firmly united and receive nourishment from the stumps of the original noses. These two facts which have fallen under the observation of all gentlemen of this residency. Gentlemen means white people. As well as my own afford sufficient testimony on this subject. But the following proof may be deemed still more satisfactory. He was not after receiving the letter, this Mr. Findlay he took additional interest in this and he wanted to watch this operation. So he, with the help of Sir Charles Mallet, at that time, Pune, it was a Peshwas, the British had not conquered. The British had a resident there or an ambassador. He was Sir Charles Mallet. 
through his influence, Mr. Crusoe, that was another surgeon, and this Findlay, they got permission to watch this procedure being done. And that's what he describes. He saw the operation being performed on the 26th Ultimo by a man of the Kumar caste, a class of Hindus chiefly employed in making the common earthenware of this country. These are the potters who with an old razor borrowed on the occasion, dissected with much composure a portion of the frontal integument from the very cranium, that is forehead, and grafted it a new operation to us in surgery on the stump of the original nose. He there retained it by a cement without the aid of stitches, sticking plaster or bandages. The patient is at present in good health and high spirits. An adhesion has taken place, that is already it is healing, seemingly in every part. When it is perfected and cauterized, I will give you a particular history of the operation and subsequent treatment. This is a letter Mr. Findlay wrote to Dr. Scott. It's a very interesting, historically important uh, document. Now that was in uh, 1793, but the next year, a British correspondent sent a report on this operation to London. A nose repair done in Pune on a patient named Kawasji, whose nose had been cut off by Tipu, and witnessed by two British surgeons, Findlay and Crusoe. This caught the attention of Joseph Carpo. He was a surgeon, he's a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. He saw this report of operation, and he did it for the first time in England, in Europe. And Carpo published his detailed paper. He waited. He wanted to make sure that this healing is uh, durable, so that what we call follow-up, he did that. And his paper came in 1816 called An Account of Two Successful Operations for Restoring a Lost Nose from the Integuments. Integuments is the forehead flap of the forehead in Gentleman's Magazine. And this Gentleman's Magazine was a very prestigious journal because you often find reference to this to this journal in uh, Samuel Johnson's life written by Boswell, which is a great uh, classic. In that uh, uh, Samuel Johnson's life, who lived in the 18th century, you will find repeated references to Gentleman's Magazine. Many important articles appeared in this journal. So that is where this Carpo's paper was published and caught the attention of the whole medical community and surgical community in Europe and all over the world. That is how it is known as the Indian technique. But the description in the uh, Susruta Samhita itself is exceedingly brief. Only I think two or three verses compared to the treatment of say opening an abscess or uh, dealing with uh, laceration. All those very, very detailed descriptions whereas when it comes to an important procedure like this, it is dismissed in two or three verses. Uh, it is difficult and lip for example repair, cleft lip, there is a description only one verse. Obviously it was done, but it does not get too much attention. And the only way the, expla the explanation for this could be uh, such an important procedure, you know Sushrata Samhita which we have today was redacted by Nagarjuna, he was not a surgeon. By that time that was in the 4th century, by that time already surgery had declined considerably. So these procedures were no longer important, the Vaidyas were not doing these procedures. So it was just listed, mentioned, not going into details because they were not doing it. It was being done by others, Kumar caste people were doing. That could be one reason why such a very brief uh, account, just two or three verses, uh, that is difficult to explain uh, in, other, in any other way. Lip repair, equally important, a deformed lip in a child. It is a lifelong trauma for the child and family, uh, very important to do, uh, but it is based in one single verse. Uh, that happens because of this, the importance of this had declined very considerably. I think that is something which we should uh, remember. Then another example, couching for cataract. Now this is also described by Sushruta and there, what is couching for cataract? In those days they knew the lens had become opaque, that was obstructing the vision. Uh, so their method was to use a needle and a probe. These were the two simple instruments. So if they knew that if they could displace the uh, opaque lens out of the way of pupil, then 
you could restore vision. This was understood. So the method followed was with a needle, you make a puncture in the right place and you introduce this probe and you dislocate the lens from its position away from the pupil so that the vision is restored. This was couching for cataract which is described in Susurda Samhita. But nobody had actually seen it done just like the repair of the nose. If the British observers had not seen it and described in such detail, I am pretty sure that none of us would be aware of this. The world would not, would be, would not be aware of it. Uh, but here again it is the same story. In 1910, when Dr. Egambaram, he witnessed it is being done in Somanur district of Tamil Nadu. I do not know where Somanur district is, but there was a district at that time. There he saw this operation and he had given a very detailed description of what he saw. And the operation was traditionally performed by members of the Kayastha caste or by Mohammedans who had little education and who had no contact with physicians. No physicians taught them. It was always taught by the father to the son. That is how it process. They had no understanding of the anatomy of the eye or vata, pitta, kapha, none of these. But if there was a cataract blindness, they knew this procedure, how to do that. They had a great deal of practical skill because repeatedly doing this. So, in fact, that description which Aikambara witnessed, as soon as this was done, he could see. He was so surprised, the patient, everybody else, they are all applauding that this great achievement. But unfortunately, the post-operative infection rate was very high and most of them lost their vision because of infection, which is understandable because there was no understanding of uh, asepsis at that time. So this again is a procedure which was popular at that time. It went out of the mainstream of Ayurveda completely. Then we have malpositions and death of the fetus. Uh, these are uh, very severe uh, conditions, uh, the obstructed labor, the head of the uh, fetus or the shoulder, transverse lie of the fetus, all these are uh, extremely dangerous. Or labor cannot progress. The woman's life is in danger. Under those conditions, surgeons would be called. And if the first priority is the mother, uh, so the baby is nearly dead with this kind of uh, transverse lie and so on, they had to do the drastic uh, operation. That is, you have to divide that obstructing part whether it is the shoulder, whether it is the head. So, some of those instruments which we have seen would be used for these. Sometimes you have to crush the head, all these uh, very severe procedures so that the obstructing part is removed and the fetus can be taken out. So, the mother's life is saved. That was the priority. Uh, but in, before doing this, the surgeon had to get royal permission as we have repeatedly mentioned. Now, attitude to high risk procedures, this is very important. Susrita Samhita deals with this. How do you, when you see something like this acute intestinal obstruction, intestinal perforation carrying very high mortality, he says the attitude to the treatment was summed up in the following statement. In the absence of surgery, death is certain. In that situation, a well-meaning physician should take up surgery. That is important. You know, he was a radical in that sense after getting permission from the authorities. It is not just to leave him alone, do not do anything. The thing is to take the risk and knowingly you take the risk. Informing the relatives, taking royal permission, you should do it. That is the duty of the surgeon. Even today that attitude is the right attitude. There is an important omission in this long list of operations uh, Sushruta gives. There is no mention of the trephining of the skull. Head was known, there was a brain inside, mastiksha was known, importance of the head, all these are described, but there is no mention of trephining of the skull in the entire Susruta Samhita. But when it comes to Jivaka, Buddha's physician, this is acclaimed, his operation of trephining of the skull. When he came back to Pataliputra after his training in Takshashila, he was so skillful, he became the physician to Buddha, he was physician to Bimbisara, the king. He operated on the fistula, anal fistula of Bimbisara, all these are described. So, a, a, a rich merchant in, uh, in Pataliputra developed severe headache, incurable and the physicians uh, gave him only seven days to live. He was that kind of severe illness and uh, Susruta was consulted with the seven days only given and he said it is curable by an operation. 
but they had to get the permission of King Bimbisara. He was a royal physician to treat a rich man, a commoner. So that permission was obtained and there he talks about this refining being done and two worms being removed and the merchant was cured of this. So this is celebrated in Buddhist literature. This is not mentioned at all in Sushruta Samhita. So I mentioned this, so therefore it is of some historical importance that tells us that in Sushruta's time this operation did not exist. It came later on. That gives some important clues about the time of uh, Sushruta. Now the decline of Sushruta's legacy, that is a subject of great importance because all these procedures pioneered by Sushruta were highly admired, surgeons were respected, Shalya was given the first place in the, all the branches of Ayurveda, all these are true in his time. But it started declining in importance and disappeared from the mainstream of Ayurveda after the, for the initial centuries of the present era, like the third, fourth centuries. By the time the Sushruta Samhita was redacted, already the importance had considerably declined. That is how a major operation like this is dismissed in two or three verses. Now these traditional Vaidyas, they no longer treated these like fractures, deliveries, surgical operations. All these are described in Sushruta. The traditional Ayurvedic physicians were no longer looking after these in the early centuries, 4th, 5th centuries. Certainly by the time of Vakpata, that was true. They were all confined to, Vaidyas confined themselves to medical treatment. Now the, from the reports of these observers, especially British observers, 18th and 19th centuries, it is very clear that all these procedures done, whether it is uh, couching for cataract or doing various types of plastic reconstructions, they were all done by people of, who were classified as lower castes. This is a, all over India that had happened. And they had no formal education, they were denied an opportunity for education and they had no social mobility. They were born into this caste and they have to keep on doing this and then teach it to their son and that is how it goes. And uh, the, the, because of this, no formal education, they had no understanding of anatomy, no understanding of Ayurveda, only this manual procedure they knew. So therefore, they could not answer the question why. Why is it you are doing? How they know how to do this, how to couch this, all that they know. But if you ask them why are you doing it like this, that they could not answer because they had no education. This was one of the greatest uh, problems in India. And this disconnection between thinking and manual skill, this was not confined to surgery alone. We have already seen something about uh, all areas of craftsmanship. We have seen an example already about steel makers of India, another greatly admired achievement of India, making good steel. We have seen that James Franklin's example, going to Jabalpur, asking these men who built uh, the uh, furnace, who built a refinery, and how do they do this? Collecting the ore, processing it in a certain manner, making steel of high quality. Now, if you ask them, why are you doing it like this, is Franklin kept asking. He could not answer any of those. He would always say, this is what my father has taught me. And uh, the steel itself, was comparable to the best Swedish steel. That was the quality of the work. And in fact, the Franklin, he says, since none of his questions could be answered, he adds, the original plan of the singular furnace must have been the work of advanced intelligence. Only somebody with advanced intelligence could design this. That is what he says. But the man actually doing it could not answer any of these uh, questions. Now, artisans, weavers, craftsmen, surgeons and those who did manual work were given an inferior position in the caste hierarchy and denied education. The cost of this massive folly was the demise of creativity. We were no longer able to create it. That was lost. And about this, uh, P.C. Ray, one of the uh, great uh, scientific pioneers of India, uh, when the British uh, came initially that what is called Indian Renaissance in Bengal, in Calcutta, P.C. Ray was one of the, one of the first uh, products of this, the founder of modern chemistry in India. And P.C. Ray in his great book on the history of uh, uh, Indian chemistry, uh, this is what he has to say, an extended quotation. According to Sushruta, the dissection of the dead body is a sine qua non to the student of surgery. And this high authority lays particular stress on knowledge gained from experiments and observations. 
but Manu would have none of it. The very touch of a corpse, according to Manu, is enough to bring contamination to the sacred person of a Brahmin. Thus we find shortly after Vagpata, the handling of a lancet was discouraged. And anatomy and surgery fell into disuse and became, to all intents and purposes, lost sciences to the Hindus. It was considered equally undignified to sweat away at the forge like a cyclops working with metals. He goes on, hence the cultivation of the Kalas by the more refined classes of the society, because Kalas, there are 64 Kalas according to Indian tradition, of which we get a vivid picture in the ancient Sanskrit literature, has survived only in traditions since a very long time past. The arts thus being relegated to the lower caste and the professions made hereditary, a certain degree of fineness, delicacy and the deftness in manipulation was no doubt achieved, but this was accomplished at a terrible cost. The intellectual portion of the community being thus withdrawn from the active participation in arts of the how and why of phenomena, the coordination of cause and effect, they were lost sight of. That was the price that India paid for this. This is P.C. Ray's picture and he concludes by saying, the spirit of inquiry gradually died out among a nation naturally prone to speculation and metaphysical subtleties. And India for once bade adieu to experimental and inductive sciences. It's a very severe indictment. Her soil was made morally unfit for the birth of a Boyle, a Descartes or a Newton. And her very name was all but expunged from the map of the scientific world for a time. Now these are the uh, very profound observations of uh, P. C. Ray. And under these circumstances, India's route in the East-West encounter was a foregone conclusion in the 19th century. That is what we learn from this uh, history of surgery uh, in India. It is a lesson that uh, we should uh, learn that is dissociating head from the hand. It was only that coordination, otherwise repetitive skills, you become skillful, dexterous, but you can never be creative. And that is something which we should remember. That is the take home message uh, from this story of Indian surgery.